Sharon Presley is a student of psychology. I believe she's received her master's degree in psychology. She's been doing studies of the psychology of people involved in the libertarian movement and finds a lot of interesting conclusions. Uh, a synopsis or an article based on her studies has appeared in a magazine called The Libertarian Connection, uh, if you wish to research it further. Her topic of tonight, or today, will be psychological laissez-faire. I'm not going to explain that, and I'll leave that up to the speaker. It'll be a quite interesting talk, I believe. Uh, before I get into the talk, I have an announcement to make uh, about another survey that I'm doing. This time it's a sociological survey of libertarians, and uh, I'm distributing it here. I think some of you may already have it. Uh, there may be some up at that table. There's also some at my button table. Um, and I'm very, very anxious to get your cooperation, and I want to just say briefly why I think this kind of thing is important. Well, first of all, as you probably know, there isn't very much data available on libertarians you know, from, uh, in psychology or sociology because it's a pretty new phenomenon. But I think it's very important that there be data uh, because uh, if we are to draw the attention of social scientists to be studied further, to be talked about in these circles, there needs to be data. You know, we can't just say libertarians are, are such and such. We have to present data. And the importance of this kind of data is because social scientists have so much influence on thinking of other people. And I think the classic example of this is the authoritarian personality study, which had uh, a great effect on people's concept of conservatives. Unfortunately, I don't think that that study was uh, a very good study in, in respect to conservatives. Was, uh, but I think it was those people who were mostly responsible for the misuse of the word fascist as it came to be synonymous with authoritarian, which of course is not a correct use of the word. At any rate, um, there are some positive examples of the influence of social scientists anyway. Um, just a few people have a great deal of influence on opinion of the layman's opinion of um, any political group. And if we want the kind of impression, if we want to have a good image, so to speak, well, we're going to need some data to present to them, assuming that the data will be good. <laughs> but I have every confidence it will be. Um, in this regard, I'm now corresponding with a sociology professor in, at the University of uh, British Columbia named David Schweitzer, who has written uh, an article called New Left is Right, Convergent Themes of Discontent, uh, in the Journal of Social Issues, volume 27, number 2, 1971. I recommend looking it up. He discusses the similarities in political philosophy between the new left and libertarian right. This is the first article in a professional journal that I've seen that discusses the, the libertarian right, or individualist libertarians. And by and large, it was pretty good. At any rate, he is very interested in the data that I'm trying to collect. And so I will be sending this data to him. And I'm sure that he'll make good use of it. He's you know, written articles before. I'm sure he'll be writing them again. So again, I urge you to fill out the questionnaire, and you can return them uh, to the, to the uh, up there to the abolitionist table, the RLA table, or to the SIL table, or to my button table. And I'll be uh, collecting them both days. You have till tomorrow. OK. Now on to my speech. Well, even though I think libertarians are pretty terrific, uh, I'm, this speech really isn't going to pat libertarians on the back that much. Uh, there's plenty of other speeches that do that. But I think we also need to be concerned not just with how wonderful we are, but uh, also with improving ourselves. Uh, I think we need to put all these terrific theories into practice in our own life, as libertarianism begins at home. Um, I'm afraid my analysis is going to be altogether too sketchy, but hopefully it will provide some food for thought and generate more thinking along similar lines. I'm hoping that there be, will be further discussion with the concepts and that my discussion will serve as a stimulus to changes in attitude and behavior and also as a catalyst for further development of the points I make. 
what I'm going to say will seem ob obvious to many of you, but uh, from what I've seen, and I've been in libertarian circles a long time, seen a lot, uh, there's a real problem. Libertarians, uh, about what they believe in theory, uh, whatever they may believe in theory, the practice leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, so I would like you to think, to look at your own behavior and evaluate what I say in terms of it and see if you have some improvement. Actually, I'm going to talk about a little bit more than uh, psychological essay fair. I want to raise the question, what are the psychological concomitants of a libertarian philosophy? What are and are not appropriate ways for libertarians to act? What manner of behavior on a personal level is an analog to what we advocate on a political level? It's a very complex subject, but I'd like to direct myself to what I think are some of the more important aspects of the issue. And one, one of the uh, aspects is what I call psychological let's affair, which I'll explain later. Without a proper psychological basis, without non-authoritarian personal attitudes, uh, without a non-authoritarian state of mind, libertarianism is off to a very inconsistent and bad start. If we, practice, if we preach libertarianism and non-authoritarianism in political life, but can't practice non-authoritarian attitudes in our personal life, how far are we going to get? How convincing are we going to be to other people? How effective? How can we reach, much less maintain, a non-authoritarian society if our personal psychology is inconsistent with our alleged principles? Uh, um, many libertarians, objectivists and anarchists alike, don't really seem to understand the true psychological spirit of libertarianism or anarchism. They can't integrate into their personal relations psychological principles analogous to their political principles. They say authoritarianism, authoritarianism is bad, but continue to act uh, in unconsciously in un uh, authoritarian ways in their attitudes and behavior toward others. Well, we've all heard the term anarcho-capitalism, and perhaps those of you who read Libertarian Forum have heard the phrase anarcho-opportunism and anarcho-quick-buckism. Um, I'd like to suggest also anarcho-authoritarianism, a contradiction if there ever was one, but I think it exists. But I don't want your objectivists to feel left out because I think there's some problems there too. <laughs> I don't show any favoritism. Uh, I'd first like to discuss psychological authoritarianism and interpersonal relations. But first of all, uh, it would be good to say briefly what I think is a healthy interpersonal relation. I'd like to borrow a paradigm from transactional analysis, as I think that their paradigm is very good for um, elucidating the point that I want to make. In transactional analysis, they see three states of being in each individual, three sources of data. There's the parent, which is a recording of unquestioned external events, a taught concept of life. The edicts of the parent state are usually imperatives, uh, using the words should, ought, always, never. Parental communications are injunctions implicit or explicit as to what you ought to do. The child is a recording of internal events, responses to what we see or hear, feelings. It's the felt concept of life. The adult is the recording of data acquired and computed through experimentation and testing, through exploration. It's the thought concept of life. This is the autonomous aspect of the individual. Each individual has all these three parts, and all three parts are necessary. Individuals interact and exchange da data with each other on any level and any combination. I'll give an example. Um, a parent-child communication might go like this. Uh, per, um, the parent in a person says, pick up your room. The child says, no, I don't want to, I don't feel like it. Okay, a more relevant example, a parent a libertarian acting in the role of parent might say, you should read Rand's articles. Boy, she really puts down anarcho-hippies, and boy, they deserve it. A child might say, shut up, Rand's a crazy old woman, I don't want to read that. Okay. 
Okay, well, that's an extreme example of a parent-child transaction, which leaves a great deal to be desired yeah. uh, on both counts. Uh, an adult-adult transaction is a neutral exchange of data. Um, for instance, uh, a libertarian, two libertarians acting in the roles of adults might say, have you read Rothbard? Uh, I understand his uh, economics are very good. Uh, the other adult might respond, yes, I've heard of him. I think I'll look into that. That's a neutral on a non-emotional type of transaction. Uh, if a person were acting in the role of parent in response to this adult, have you heard of Rothbard? Uh, he might say, Rothbard? Oh, what? Or, is it? Uh, Rothbard, why he's an anarchist, he's not even on Rand's approved list, you shouldn't read him. <laughs> okay, as I said, a healthy psyche needs a balance between all three states. We need, you know, information from all three states. But the healthiest transaction is an adult-adult transaction. Can't be the only one, but it's the one to strive for. The parent-child transaction has authoritarian elements in it. The parent is the boss who tells the child what to do, and the child accept, either accepts it submissively and gives in or responds negatively in a very emotional way that doesn't provide adult data. The parent is the authority figure who delivers injunctions disguised as information or rational data. The child is the follower who accepts it without question, without considering other sources of data. In an adult-adult exchange, each recognizes the other as an autonomous adult, one, a person who can think for himself, who should and make his own decisions, and who is a psychological equal in this sense. You know, politically, what libertarians are advocating is a system analogous to the adult-adult paradigm, where individuals are autonomous, make rational decisions, and choose actions voluntarily. Uh, we reject authoritarian pol political systems, which are analogous to the parent-child paradigm. So if we advocate adult-adult exchanges politically, we should strive for them on a psychological level. If politically we advocate decentralization and autonomous decision-making, then psychosociologically we should strive for autonomy and a more equal balance of decision-making, less authority figures. Many libertarians don't live up to the adult-adult paradigm. Ask yourself if you're one of them. They like to come on authoritarian as parent rather than adult. They enjoy telling others what to do, confusing a leader role with a boss or parent role. Sometimes it is appropriate for a leader if what you mean by leader is someone with appropriate knowledge or skills or initiative, but not authority by fiat, not saying, you do my way, things my way, or else. They fail to recognize the right of others to be autonomous, afraid to let others help make decisions, even when it's appropriate. Their superhero image, their ego, is threatened if they are not in control. They look down on other people, unconsciously perhaps, sometimes consciously, but usually unconsciously, come, condescendingly coming on as parents and treating others as child. Some come on as parents in the role of authority figure. I have the truth, and if you don't agree with me, you're not a true fill in the blank, you know, everybody does it, whatever. Um, a very good fiction paradigm for autonomous adult relationships is in a book called The Great Explosion, a science fiction story by Eric Frank Russell, which unfortunately is out of print, but if you can find it anywhere, I really recommend it. It's really very good. Anyway, what happens, um, the Terran or the Earth ambassadors come to this long lost colony of Earth that hasn't been in contact with, people, with other people for several hundred years. And they land on the planet and they say essentially to the people, take me to your leader. Uh, then these people don't know what he's talking about. Leader, what's that mean? You know, they don't understand because they don't have leaders. It's essentially an anarchist society. But there's a point at which uh, some of the men from the ship are talking to this woman. They're saying, oh, we've got to get back. This is a paraphrase. Uh, we've got to get back to the ship. Um, the um, captain said that we must be in by such and such a time. And she looks at them with great incredulity and says, you mean you actually let people tell you what to do? That's the kind of society we should strive for. Because the other side of the coin of being, you know, coming on parent is coming on as child, allowing ourselves to be followers when we should be equals. 
Uh, I'll be looking at um, a more political examples a little later. Right now, I want to look specifically at various kinds of sh social roles where authoritarianism can sneak in. Well, for instance, in love relationships and marriage, uh, does one person, usually the man, but not always, try to be dominant, play the parent to the other's child, make the decisions for both? Do women slip into un unconsciously into conventional secondary roles? I'll be discussing this at much greater length in my speech tomorrow on women's and men's liberation, which I think I'll have some interesting points to make, so I won't discuss that too much further. In family relations, if you have children, well, you have to be parents sometimes because you have to teach them, but you can interact with them in an adult-adult manner rather than cramming parental injunctions down their throat. If you want them to be rational adults, you have to start treating them like that now because children respond to the example of their parents. Uh, an excellent book which discusses the way parents and children can interact in an adult-adult relationship is a book called Between Parent and Child by uh, Pam Gannot, and also there's one called Between Parent and Teenager, and they're both out in paperback now. I think this is a much way, better way of, of handling uh, handling relationships instead of spanking them and so forth. Then education. Now here's an area where libertarians should really be concerned with this problem. Uh, we know that adults really first learn about authoritarianism, well probably first from their parents, but then the second place is in the schools, particularly in the schools, so they're really brainwashed into an, into an authoritarian mold where they have to accept what's passed out to them. Of course, never tend to realize this, but I wonder, do we still fall into this kind of conventional authoritarian school role in our, in our own thinking? particularly directing this to parents, any of you who are teachers, and political activists engaged in education. Do you come on authoritarian parent to would-be learners, telling them instead of engaging in some kind of mutual exchange? Do you act like an authority figure, not to be questioned? Or do you have a free and easy give and take with those who would be your students or whatever? Political activists. Do you preach, trying to get whoever you're talking to to agree with your own particular sect or cult, rather than presenting just ideas for them to think about? Remember, the aim of education is not to teach so much as it is to help people to think. Now I want to talk about work roles. A non-authoritarian model is really needed here. I think this has probably received less consideration than perhaps the other areas I'm talking about. Uh, traditional jobs have usually have a definite hierarchy and authoritarian structure. The employee, employer is often the boss or parent in the psychological sense. Uh, the employee is a child. Employers don't have to come on as parents. They needn't be as needn't be rigid. They're you know, like especially like unimportant things like how you dress and so forth. But um, you know I think there's room for improvement. For instance, if you want to understand the appeal of anarcho-syndicalism, I think it's a desire to have a work situation that is not parent-child, but rather a situation in which workers can be adults, autonomous beings, able to make their own decisions and control their own lives. Well, most of you probably don't buy that particular method of obtaining autonomy, but can you question the desirability of autonomy of wanting adult-adult exchanges, of decentralization of decision-making when possible. There are alternatives. Uh, the best paradigm for an adult-adult labor exchange that I think would be appropriate for most libertarians is the agoric model. Agoric essentially means market exchange. Instead of boss and employees, each person is an individual sub independent subcontractor. For instance, the owner of a plant might need a certain job done. Instead of having employees who punch in nine to five and he tells them what to do, he subcontracts, he decides what he needs, subcon and the subcontractor delivers it in his own way. He controls the decision making, he works at his own schedule whenever he wants to. Maybe he wants to work from midnight to six in the morning. Maybe he wants to work three days a week for longer hours instead of five. He can do whatever he wants. Just, you know, he, he just has to deliver the end product. 
Okay, agoric exchanges are not possible in every situation. Uh, an example is, is at a crude point, but I think we need to develop ideas, uh, make adapt the agoric model as much as possible. I think it's the kind of ideal toward which we should strive. Now I want to look at our political roles as libertarians. I certainly think organizations should avoid as much as possible hierarchical structures, particularly when it lends itself to authority figures and authoritarian structures. We need more than just autonomy, we need decentralization as much as possible, whether it's in our far-off utopia of private services, or right now in our political organizations like SIL or some of the others. A central um, or point should be a clearinghouse for information only, not the final decision maker. I think that's something that we should try to avoid as much as possible. Our role and our roles in these organizations should be ones of as much equal decision making as possible. Like, for instance, the hierarchical structure of officers is really out of it. It's so strange. I remember once an organization I was involved in, we had to present a list of officers uh, we were obligated to because it was a campus organization. I thought it was really a joke, you know, because we just didn't function that way. We didn't need to. Um, but it can happen, this kind of thing can happen in more subtle ways, too. I think we have to remember not to be followers. You know, we need, if you're involved in an organization, you know, involve yourself in the decision making. Don't, uh, sometimes leaders are leaders by default. Then there are libertarians obs obsessed with political ideas, certain political ideologies who really are on an on a authoritarian trip. For instance, many objectivists really like to come on parent while claiming to be adult or rational. They deliver injunctions to the world. Now, I want to emphasize that I don't mean the philosophy, but certain people's interpretation of the philosophy. It's one thing to have beliefs about desirable ways to act, codes of ethics, and communicate them in a calm, reasonable manner. But some objectivists come on you should do this, and if you don't, you're an anti-mind muscle mystic. You're a moral degenerate. <laughs> they demand that their interpretation is the only possible correct one. They personally have the corner on truth, and they demand obedience. They demand that you come on child and submit and to their interpretation. There, some are very closed-minded and refuse to even consider alternatives to see if there's anything new to be learned or gained. But at the same time, the respond as child to the parental injunctions of Rand. She is the authority figure never to be questioned. Objectivist philosophy calls for autonomy, but instead these objectivists follow her interpretation of that philosophy like robots. I can't resist quoting a friend of mine who once said, the objectivist faith in Ayn Rand as the sole source of accurate data is really, you know, nuts. But uh, anarchists aren't going to escape. I'm going to talk about some of their shortcomings in a few minutes when I talk about psychological essay fair. In fact, that's where I am right now. Um, OK, we believe that people should be able to do whatever they want, as long as you know, they're acting not coercively. We believe in political laissez fair as well as economic. But I think that laissez fair is not just a political or an economic concept. I think that is applicable to psychological and social attitudes. If laissez-faire means letting people alone, not interfering with their actions, the psychological laissez-faire means leaving them alone psychologically, granting them the autonomy psychologically that they should have politically, letting them alone to live their life as they see fit without denouncing or putting them down for, from, for differing from you, in other words, tolerance. Specifically, I have in mind tolerance of attitudes, activities, and lifestyles of others, as long as they're not coercive. Psychological laissez-faire entails emo <clears throat> the emotional as well as the intellectual realization that precisely since we are all individuals, all different, we cannot all have exactly the same values, tastes, likes, and dislikes. Difference in values leads to difference in actions. While most, while we could agree on the general parameters of desirable uh, behavior, you know, don't act coercively, 
individual goals, individual tastes, personal lifestyles cannot be matters of general agreement. There's no one right way for everyone to act in regard to personal lives. Individualism, which we presumably espouse, means granting that each granting that each individual has the right to decide his own values and respecting that right. Psychological essay fair means not attributing immorality to someone who doesn't act the exact same way you do, who doesn't see things your way. Now let me emphasize that I'm not advocating moral relativism or not having opinions, um, although I think a lot of libertarians' opinions are based more on prejudice than fact. But anyway, uh, I, if you're going to have opinions, if you disagree with someone, I think you should disagree reasonably in a calm, reasonable manner, not viciously and emotionally. There's no reason to be upset or hostile because someone's different. No reason to de resort to denunciations, name-calling, and so other such unpleasant tactics. A lot of libertarians don't seem to be able to integrate less they fear in, uh, into their personal attitudes. And I hate to say this, but I think this is especially true in the East and the Midwest. Um, I've come from California, and my observations of both coasts is that in California there's a much greater feel, a genuine feeling for harmony, uh, that how people want to live their lives is their own business, and there's no reason to get upset about someone's different. I have my opinion, you have yours. We can still work together. It's kind of the attitude. Straight libertarians work hand in hand with freak libertarians. Objectivists even work with anarchists. <laughs> but it sure doesn't look like that in the East, from what I can tell, which I think is very unfortunate. Uh, I know some of you people have put California libertarians down for various reasons, some of which I'll mention later. But I think that they, uh, you know, generally speaking, understand psychological laissez-faire a lot better than a lot of Easterners do. Now, I want to examine some specific ways that I think libertarians have been guilty of a lack of psychological laissez-faire, particularly in regard to the atti their attitudes toward other libertarians. Hopefully, this examination will be instructive and productive, cause each of you to re-examine your own attitudes and see if they're consistent with libertarian philosophy. But intolerance won't help us either as individuals or as a movement. It poisons our minds individually, and particularly when applied to other libertarians, weakens the movement. We're hardly in a position to indulge in internecine fighting. We can't afford to waste our energies fighting among ourselves when we should be directing our attentions to the real enemy, the state. As Eric North once said in the LC, in the Libertarian Connection, pigs are playing for keepsies. <laughs> However, I'm afraid it's going to be very hard to get intolerant libertarians to change, since putting down other libertarians is a pastime in libertarian circles, second only of in popularity to discussing how epistemology will change the universe. Okay, now I'd, like, now I'd like to analyze a little further some specific examples of this dangerous trend. One very prevalent breach of psychological essay fair is hostility toward the lifestyles of others. The most conspicuous example, perhaps, is the anti-counterculture theme, um, which has a t and the, those who advocate this have a tendency to see it in simplistic terms, seeing only the bad and refusing to see the good, seeing the mysticism but refusing to see the yearning and striving for personal autonomy, the rejection of dehumanizing values, which many counterculture people so-called advocate. Most of you probably know what libertarian journal is best known for promoting a counterculture theme, <laughs> if you don't ask me later. But I have some much more, actually some much more lurid examples than that. Um, there really seems to be a definite undercurrent of feeling against, for instance, so-called hippies among libertarians, at least in the East, those in California, you know, half of them are. <laughs> uh, for instance, here's an incident that was related to me about it, something that happened at a past New York conference, a civil conference. There were some libertarians selling uh, shirts and pouches and stuff like that. And they were evidently insulted by alleged libertarians who said things like, well, I see the hippies are here. You know, what kind of attitude is this? Does long hair and beads make you a moral degenerate? Evidently so to some people. <laughs> but I've got another quote, and I'm going to spare the author the embarrassment of naming him because I don't want to focus on personalities. I want to focus on behavior. But in case you want to double check for yourself. 
Let's read it in its total context. It's from the Torch, March 1970 issue, page 7. Um, okay, quote, what sports long hair and freaky clothes conspires to overthrow the government, perish the fun, shouts all power to the people, advocates radical decentralization of the government, smokes pot, drops acid, dig, uh, digs acid rock, carries picket signs, and may be found with a company of communists. Answer, if you guess the name of an SDS or a Black Panther, you score only half credit because you obviously stopped reading newspapers about a year ago. It may just as well now call itself a libertarian. He also goes on to imply on page 11 that those who like rock music are aesthetically and morally degenerate in rather <laughs> vivid terms. Um, the examples, these two examples I cited are classic examples of guilt by association. Since many people who wear long hair and wear unusual clothes are not libertarians and are associated with ideas of groups that are not libertarian, then everyone with long hair is seen as a good old anti-mind muscle mystic. And I would like to thank Jerome Tuchili for that paraphrase of someone we all know. If you carry such thinking to its logical extreme, by analogy, you could just as well say that men with short hair and ties are um, FBI, FBI agents excluding the FBI agents in this audience. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> this kind of guilt by association is just another example, old-fashioned prejudice, judging a person not by his individual characteristics, but against some stereotype. That's collectivism, remember? We're supposed to be against that. Uh, another principle which I think is particularly appropriate to mention in regard to guilt by association and is important to an understanding of psychological less affair is one formulated by Milton Rokich, a psychologist who wrote a book called The Open and Closed Mind. Essentially it says that what is psychologically significant about a person's belief system is not so much what he believes, but why and in what manner he believes it. The same is true for actions. Two individuals may hold the same opinion and do the same things, but for entirely different reasons. For example, one individual may believe in capitalism because he's been taught that it's good, the American way, and doesn't question it. Another person may advocate capitalism because he's carefully studied economics and philosophy and he's convinced it's the best system. One person may wear long hair because all his friends are doing it, it's the thing to do, and he wants to be accepted. Uh, it's kind of the uniform of certain political groups or jeans, like jeans or the uniform of certain political groups. But another individual may wear long hair simply because he likes it, or maybe he doesn't like to go to the barber, but you know, so what? We should judge people not on their outward appearance, but on not only just what they believe, but the way in which they believe it, look deeper than the surface. Now another way in which certain libertarians are very intolerant is in regard to the anti-drug thing. Now, I'd like to make a disclaimer here that uh, I personally um, don't use drugs, but so I'm not beating my own drum. Uh, I like trying to be very objective about it. Now, this anti-drug theme appears in some, object many, uh, some objectivist-oriented publications and also in the Libertarian Forum. The objectivist publications insinuate that any person who uses drugs is a mindless degenerate. I'd like to quote that delightful Torch article again. It's talking in regard to the number, increasing number of hippies, so-called, in the New Libertarian Movement. Quote, the identifying characteristic of a hippie is a hatred of self-discipline as manifests itself in his mindless conformity to fads, his dress, and his desire to obliterate his consciousness through drugs. Well, the Brokeach principle holds here too, not so much what you do, but why you do it. Libertarians who use drugs, and particularly pot, are not all seeking to obliterate their consciousness. Some misuse it, that's true. Some merely use it for pleasure. And I don't want to get into the big discussion of that now, I just want to briefly make my point. If you want to ask me questions later, okay. Um, and if you use alcohol, don't criticize pot. Some of, the, uh, some of the most brilliant and productive libertarians I know use drugs. There's an, I have found no correlation between productivity and lack of drug use, or vice versa. 
And uh, I would again emphasize that individuals should be judged on their individual accomplishments, accomplishments, not whether they turn on. The libertarian forum argument against drugs seems to be that it's counter-revolutionary, which smacks the progressive labor rhetoric. <laughs> and they are the most humorless bunch of people I've ever seen. But, uh, but I don't think it's true. As I've said before, I don't see any necessary connection. I've found none between uh, lack of productivity and drug use. Uh, in fact, I even know libertarians who, be, who became libertarians because they smoked pot. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I don't advocate that as a way to, to get libertarians, but it has happened that, you know, that they've kind of relaxed and been less authoritarian and seemed to value libertarian ideas after they kind of relaxed psychologically. Uh, anyway, as far as drug use goes, uh, it still boils down to the good old libertarian principle, mind your own business. Um, and also I might add that it, contrary to the opinion of the author of that Torch article, California, the reason that there are so many heads in California is not just because they proselytize among other drug users, it's implied. Uh, another lifestyle that's frequently put down in libertarian circles is retreatism, the libertarian nomads. So what? If some libertarians think that their own self-interest is best served this way, that's their decision. Why should we get upset about it? Are we obligated to serve the libertarian cause? Is there something that do we have to sacrifice to the movement? Can't we keep to ourselves? Um, I think there are plenty of libertarians who are not retreatists, and it's simply no reason to get upset about the ones who are. And contrary to certain East Coast opinions, half the libertarian movement is not retreatist. They seem to think that, you know, that they're all hiding out in caves or something. <laughs> it's not true. Another popular form of intolerance is intolerance of pol different political styles or political activities. Some libertarians seem to think there's only one right way of promoting libertarianism and put anyone down who uses any other approach than theirs. Well, we can all have our own opinions about which methods are the most productive, but isn't there room for multiple approaches anyway? I think we need different approaches to reach different kinds of people. And if one way doesn't appeal to you personally, it isn't your trip, well, you know, pursue the approach that suits you, but don't put down others for doing it other ways. Each way, I think, has some effect. Let's not see ourselves as, and now I'm paraphrasing from Tuchili's new book, which is very funny, by the way. Let's not see ourselves as 12 middle-of-the-road anarchists surrounded by 5,000 deviationists. <laughs> okay, now I'll look at some specific examples of uh, this kind of intolerance. There's the educationists who think that any kind of action defiles their purity. Of course, action is extremely important. I'm not going to put it down at all, but I don't think it excludes other possibilities. And there are other ways to educate people besides writing articles. These ways can complement written material. For example, alternative institutions, schools, private protection, and so on, uh, show how theory can work in practice. Are we going to exclude, exclude people from the movement simply because they're impressed by practical examples? Or resistance. First of all, resistance can be a means of education, which witnessed the National Taxpayers Union. And I believe there's going to be a talk on tax resistance. That's very good. Uh, such groups and issues uh, attract people who may not have come into it in uh, contact with explicit libertarian ideas before. But after being attracted by the issue, they might be quite open to libertarian ideas, which are promoted through these kinds of uh, organizations. And then individual resistance. Well, if the army wants to steal two years of your life, giving them pamphlets won't keep you free. Of course, I can't deny the usefulness of anything except direct action. I guess there was an unpleasant incident several years ago at a SEAL conference in regard to that. Uh, no, I don't think advocating only direct action is reasonable also. If we don't change people's ideas, it won't do any good to change the system. We need the intelligent arguments. We need both. Then there's libertarians who put down working with the new left. But contrary to the opinion of some, it is possible for people other than objectivists to become libertarians. Many people are attracted to the new left because they've seen no other alternative to the authoritarian and oppressive status quo. These kind of people aren't dogmatic Marxists. They're not... They're not... Uh, 
thugs and mindless mystics. A group as large as the New Left can't be one monolithic point of view uh, to lump them all together as blatant collectivist thinking, just as dogmatically intolerant as the most rigid Marxist. Certainly it's true that in the New Left there are uh, people who are just you know, have nothing in common with libertarians, but I do think that there are people, uh, individuals, who approach them on an individual basis. There are many people open to libertarian ideas, because I know many of them. And then there's working with non -liber libertarians who work with non libertarian groups. Um, I understand that there's a person in New York who is afraid to admit his connection with gay liberation for fear of being ridiculed. Now, how incredible. And what your personal opinion on. Uh, bisexuality or homosexuality, okay, fine, but that doesn't mean you have to put other people down for doing it. This is really incredible that someone should be afraid to admit this kind of connection in libertarian circles. Uh, another popular pastime is putting down alternative communities like Atlantis, Mike Oliver's New Country, and the Ocean Platform Project. Well, at least they're trying to put their ideas into practice doing something besides just talking about it. What's wrong with this approach? What if it works? If the rest of us fail to change society, uh, it might be our only alternative. I think given the present situation, we should be encouraging these kind of things. Some of them aren't going to work, but you know, some might. We might learn something from it. Then there's intolerance of differences in ideology within the libertarian movement. The focal point in most of this seems to be around objectivism. There are the cult orthodox objectivists, and then there are the serious reasonable objectivists. Then there, no, it's true, both kinds exist. Then we have the cult anti-objectivists and the people who have very seriously and have very serious and carefully considered objections. They're kind of four groups, you know, at least. Now I've discussed a little bit the cult objectivists. You see, everyone who disagrees with them is more like degenerate. Um, they're busy putting down so-called anarcho hippies, like the Torch author. But uh, then there are the cult militant anarchists who like to engage in childish exchanges of name calling, refusing to grant Rand credit for influencing the movement as much as she has, refusing to see any of her any good points in her ideas, confusing her dogmatic intolerance uh, and her dogmatic interpretation of her philosophy with the philosophy itself. I think they're distinct. Um, if you look objectively, if you'll pardon the expression, at both cultists, both sets of cultists. Name calling is a classic example of a parent-parent ex uh, exchange, uh, or I'm sorry, a child-child exchange, like little children stamping their feet. Sometimes they come on parent-parent too, telling each other that they're raising the only right way. Which brings me to the topic of name calling. If someone we just if we have something that we disagree with, why not criticize constructively and specifically instead of talk, tossing out self-righteous vituperative remarks? Vituperation reveals more about the criticizer than the criticized. I think that name calling is particularly inappropriate in serious writing. It seems to me that the intellectual parameters of writing, I mean, talking about essay writing, should be more restricted than is true for private conversations. While it may be appropriate or emotionally satisfying to call someone a running dog or an Attila, these epithets have more, are more emotional than rational, and I think they have very much substantive content, and I think that's what serious writing should have. My examples certainly don't exhaust all the possibilities. A lot more could be said on the psychological concomitants of libertarian philosophy. We might discuss rigidity, self-liberation, and so forth. Um, much more needs to be developed. This is really just the beginning. I'd really like to see further development of, these, of this theme, particularly in conceptualizing non-authoritarian relationships, in labor exchanges like the Gort model, in education, in political activities. But not just theory. Why well, won't practice? Examine carefully and objectively your own behavior and try to eradicate all vestiges of authoritarianism and intolerance from your own thinking. It's time we were all libertarians psychologically as well as politically. <laughs> <laughs>